I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh, thank you for the Manhattan Institute. This panel is Policing and Terrorism, a report from the home front, uh, certainly the events of 9-11, and as we look back now after 10 years, have reframed in many ways uh, what policing is about, how we consider security at home, um, new terms like homeland security, um, as well as new agencies have been introduced into the lexicon. So to frame the issue, and we've got a great panel here, and um, rather than, than go through the introductions uh, which lead up time, you do have the sheet with the bios and if you look at Bill Bratton, Mike Downing, Rick Fuentes, um, and John Timoney, we've got, we've, got the, we've got the right people here. So to frame the issue, since 9-11, if you take the, the totality of the discussion um, that we've had to date, three things emerge that matter a lot. One was 9-11 itself, because it changed our view, as Mike Sheehan just pointed out, about scalability. That a foreign group that was not a state could reach <coughs> into U.S. soil, kill 3,000 people on a single day in multiple locations. Prior to that, that was beyond our concept. Uh, second thing that matters is the London Plains plot. Why does that matter? It matters because, as we've also discussed, Al-Qaeda is not geared to run another half million dollar, two and a half year operation but they showed us with the London Plains plot that they could achieve plots that were capable of delivering 9-11 type casualties, two to 3,000 victims, on a really uh, shoestring budget. So that was frightening and enlightening at the same time as a prevention. The third thing was Mumbai, because it actually challenged the issue of scalability. Maybe you didn't have to kill two to 3,000 people to matter. If you accepted, as someone else said her, here earlier today, that terrorism is theater, creating that drama and capturing the airwaves for three days with conventional weapons, AK-47s and homemade explosives, could you achieve the same level of fear and anxiety within a society about the government's ability to protect them? So you look at those three things. And consider one other thing, which is, where's America's head on this right now? A 2002 poll found, logically so, after 9-11, 97% of Americans considered terrorism as the, the greatest issue facing our country and our government. A poll from August um, of this year uh, by CNN showed that 3% of Americans believe that terrorism is the greatest issue facing our country right now outpaced by the economy, jobs, uh, housing, and so on. Um, a Fox News poll, because you can always count on Fox, brought that up to 5%. So we know the people who are more worried about this are watching Fox. Um, but still, if you take the three or the 5%, and then you take the changes in policing, you wonder, um, you wonder how that affects our ability to sustain these efforts in police departments. So I will, I will set that up as the first question, which is 10 years later, as budgets are growing smaller, as the federal money is going to start to continue to grow smaller, how has 9-11 in a decade changed policing? And what is policing's ability to sustain it? And that everybody's conclusion prior to this panel today is that in large measure this is working. Let me start with um, Commissioner Bratton. Well, the good news, John, I think coming out of 9-11 is that we have gotten better at the local police level of dealing with this issue. We've learned a lot. We've contributed a lot. A lot of the initiatives that have helped to make the country safer have certainly come out of local policing. New York certainly uh, leading LAPD and many other agencies. 
We have also benefited in the traditional crime area by the gains that we've made in appreciating the importance of information, the gathering of it, the sharing of it, the analysis of it, and making intelligence out of it. And policing over the last 10 years has gone through several evolutions very rapidly. And those evolutions have gone from the information era into the intelligence era and now into what is being described as the predictive policing era where uh, yesterday in the paper, the New York uh, City Police uh, unveiled their $49 million real-time crime center. And that center is really focused on much more significantly improved use of intelligence, but intelligence that is much more focused on the prevention of crime and predicting where it's going to occur rather than improving the reaction and response to it. So we are in a better place, but going forward, uh, and Mike Downey, I think, is the uh, only acting serving member still, uh, actually, Rick Frenchy, the two of them still in the business. Uh, I'm very worried going forward because I've watched over the last 10 years the uh, reduction in focus and interest on the part of many of my colleagues in major city policing as they're facing other pressures, particularly resource pressures. So that uh, I see the continuing crises every day, police departments laying off people, police departments with fewer monies to work with, that the gains that we made on partnerships, intelligence gathering, technology, are going to be eroded. And the focus on this issue, uh, I think the polling you just uh, talked about, the 3%, 5%, if you poll police departments, you'd probably see a similar number. Let me, let me jump to John Timoney, uh, Chief of Police, uh, Chief of Operations in the NYPD yeah. prior to 9-11, Chief of Police in Philadelphia during 9-11 in Miami, um, later, so you have faced this in several different uh, city models and demographics. One of the most interesting things you said to me is the problem within policing and terrorism is that terrorism is boring, yep. meaning it's tedious, intelligence collection and watching the front, and in police departments faced with real crime problems and substantive issues, it is hard to get people to maintain that focus. Uh, how do you see that as a problem uh, across the country? Well. On 9-11, I was in, in Philadelphia, and like most police departments, we wound up throwing bodies at it, if you will, for the first week, two weeks, the iconic buildings, signature buildings. But it was clear to me going forward that that was not a sustainable model. It cost much. And then uh, how is it going to prevent uh, a future bombing? Clearly, the area was intelligence. And as we began to look over the next year, we talked about fusion centers. There were meetings all across the country with uh, local chiefs. It just, it just seemed to me early on that we were starting to see, outside New York City, complacency start to set in, uh, but in the general public, but also, in some respects, uh, to police officers. If you understand cops, they're all about action, going out there, locking up the bad guy. That's what they do. That's what's in their blood. The whole notion of telling them to calm down and analyze this, to paraphrase the movie to tell you, analyze that, and they want to go out and uh, do their thing. So, so it's real difficult. The, the benefit, though, uh, of coming out of that, for me at least, was what 9-11 did uh, to the FBI and other intelligence gathering uh, operations. Uh, I said earlier outside to somebody, the, for example, the FBI pre-9-11 and the FBI today are completely two different animals. There was, you know, we, we would, Jack Maple uh, would kid around, work for myself and Bill, he would say, the biggest lie in law enforcement is that we work well together. It's a joke. We never worked well together, never spoke uh, to one another. But the fact of the matter is, post 9-11, the FBI has done, I think, a very good job, not a perfect job, a very good job of sharing that intelligence. And they have, if, if you will, the, the requisite uh, skills, the, the right people. And, you know, for the last seven years I was in Miami, as the chief of Miami, I was a co-chair of the Terrorism Task Force of South Florida. And I never felt once uh, out of the loop. Uh, the information that was shared. Are there seams uh, where things can escape? Absolutely. But, but the way it's set up now, and I'm, I'm reading for the rest of the country, I think the, the whole Joint Terrorism Task Force at the 56 offices is actually a pretty good model that's set up. We've got to make sure that the CIA tells the FBI, and then we've got to make sure that the FBI shares. I think that was the message coming out of the 9 11 uh, Commission. I don't think with the exception of maybe New York, certainly New York, but maybe LA and one or two other cities, 
that the vast majority of cities have either the personnel, the skills, or dare I say, the attention to devote to what's, to, to what's needed. New York will always be, you heard Ray Kelly tonight explain, this morning, all that New York has done, uh, because New York's been hit twice, and there's been a few attempts that have been foiled, and New York will always be the target. And so, in New York, there's not an issue of complacency or taking your eye off the target. That's, that's there, but for the rest of America, it's a difficult proposition. Well, then, then that's a logical transition to Rick Fuentes, uh, superintendent and colonel of the New Jersey State Police. You took your agency after 9-11 and took it from a, a fairly conventional state police model and morphed it into uh, an agency that was largely poised as a statewide counterterrorism agency, uh, even by changing the focus of patrol functions, the people who were looking at trucks on the highways, uh, your aviation and marine people. <clears throat> were you able to sustain that, and were you able to get a balance back um, that is right for the long-term future, for the next decade? Well, I think, uh, I think the key is in leveraging the routine of what you do every day, and I think uh, Bill said it in the City Journal article uh, that was written uh, uh, before this conference that you have to do aggressive criminal enforcement, you have to do aggressive traffic enforcement, and if you're good on those two fronts, you're going to get to the people that are going to pop up on the terrorism front, and I think that's important. The, inf uh, the uh, level of information sharing now is absolutely incredible, and we're not just collecting the dots and connecting the dots, but we're predicting what those dots mean, and I think that's what Bill said. So the geospatial predictive analytics, the three words uh, I couldn't even put together five <laughs> or six years ago, uh, really now run uh, the grain of what we do in our fusion center uh, in supplying information to our 15 uh, urban cities in New Jersey, uh, not just about counterterrorism, but about crime. And I think that's an important point. Our, our fusion center puts out about 1,000 products a year. Seven out of every 10 have to do with crime and only three have to do with counterterrorism. So it goes to the heart of what the cities are concerned about, but also by making, uh, giving those decisions or giving that information to police chiefs, you just allow them to be more or, or better decision makers in deploying their people. And if that happens, you're gonna come up with those who are engaged in political crime as well as conventional criminal activity. So Mike Downing, taking that um, state police intelligence model and bringing it into a big city model, uh, one of the big questions that comes up is, okay, everybody wanted a fusion center with Homeland Security dollars after 9-11, but 10 years later, people are looking at, are these things going to live um, or are they going to wither? Can you separate terrorism from crime if you're, if you're running the, the fusion correctly? No, not at all. I think you have to keep them together. Our fusion center uh, sits on seven counties with 166 police departments that serve 18 million people. So there's an incredible opportunity uh, to collect against the threat and also understand the crim criminal enterprise network and how those interact with the social networks. The problem is now, I think, and our challenge uh, as we go forward is how do we complement what the FBI does in terms of domestic intelligence? Um, how do we take advantage of the decentralized law enforcement structure that we have in the United States and also power up the fusion centers, the 72 fusion centers. There are uh, different fusion centers are in different levels of maturity. You know, we formed, stormed, normed, and now we're performing, I think. You go through those stages. And, um, and a smaller department might ask, well, what's in it for me? And I think we have the opportunity to show what's in it for these smaller agencies is that we can help identify other criminal enterprises, other threats, whether it be gangs or whatnot. But to do that, uh, we need, because right now I think uh, collection is not focused. I think it's a bit haphazard. The suspicious activity reporting is a great baseline capability and it institutionalized the idea of behavior and what we see. But now I think law enforcement is ready for this next leap forward in complementing what the FBI does and putting all that other information with traditional crime uh, in the mix, and Chief Bratton's right, exactly right, that this is a force multiplier for us. As we continue to collect this, refine our collection, develop anticipatory intelligence, we can exploit that and do more disruption. How would you all grade um, the federal agencies that emerged or re-emerged out of 9-11? FBI transformation, we've had a word or two about that. 
the creation and, and the learning curve of DHS, <coughs> where would you put them now? And, um, and the DNI, uh, which is um, an organization that, that was born out of great debate um, as to whether it would be an effective coordinator or another level of bureaucracy. Um, I'll start with John Timoney. Well, the, the DHS obviously was set up with, with Tom Ridge, who I knew from my days in Philly, and clearly set up in an, an emergency situation. You, you can just picture it. It's almost a Harvard, Harvard Business School approach. You have a white piece of paper. Let's list all the agencies that have in any way, shape, or form some kind of impact on egress, access, a whole host of things. And only doing a process like that could you come up with having the border security and secret service report to the same boss, right? And I understand it was set up in an emergency situation, but I had done a few interviews prior to the 2008 election saying, fine, we've, had, we've been lucky, we have DHS, but is that the model you want to use going forward? Is it probably time for the new administration, no matter who it was, Obama or McCain, call a timeout, let's go back to the drawing board. We see what we've learned, do we want to change? Because there were issues of, of morale and, a whole, and performance and a whole host of things. Needless to say, the new administration hit the ground running and there wasn't any reorganization. And so DHS remains as it was uh, uh, back in 2002. But worse than that, the 9-11 Commission came out. Clearly, I realized that on 9-11 in Philadelphia, there was a huge intelligence failure. You didn't have to be a genius to figure that out. The 9-11 Commission, after hearing testimony, concluded the same thing. And it really was between the CIA and the FBI. And so coming out of the a whole series of recommendations was a law that was passed establishing the DNI. About 16, 17 pages, the first 15 pages read perfectly all the things you should be doing. Page 16 says disregard the first 15 pages uh, because what's in this law is not meant to undermine or take away the power and the authority of the FBI director, the CIA director. And so the whole notion to have a one-stop shopping collection and dissemination at the DNI just it just hasn't existed. So I so always hated page 16. <laughs> well, that's right. You worked at the DNI. <laughs> um, well, and, and, and you want to tackle any of that on, on how you would grade the federal agencies that came out of it? I'll give you a couple of thoughts that uh, the transformation of the FBI uh, mandated by Congress and that uh, Director Mueller has done a extraordinary job literally turning that agency from a crime focus to an intelligence terrorism focus over the last 10 years. He's done a great job, but my own perspective is that uh, I think the Bureau is going to lose a lot of the connectivity to local police by focusing only on terrorism. That if we appreciate that so much of the information, actionable intelligence relative to terrorism is going to come from traditional crime reporting, local police, the Bureau, which through most of its history has attempted to work with local police in that arena, in many, most respects failed. The relationships, as John reported prior to 9-11, were by and large not good. Post 9-11, that uh, there's been a real sea change in the relationships with the Bureau. I spent a lot of my time in LA working on that. Uh, Director Muller has certainly done it through his uh, field offices. But I think that uh, very similar to the mistake that was made with Homeland Security. Early on, they created an entity that is still very unwieldy and is not doing all it's capable of doing. Same for the Bureau. I think the Bureau, by ne more narrowly defining its mission on terrorism, uh, we are in fact weakening relationships between the Bureau and local police. That I think the, the Bureau really needs to be rethought in terms of its function, to have a dual function rather than the single focus that's going forward. Similarly, uh, going back to the point about Homeland Security, the way it was created, and it was done like this, and we're still feeling the repercussions of it. I've been doing work recently with uh, Border and Customs, and there's an entity that's been formed, but Border Patrol, their internal affairs investigations are done by a separate agency, ICE and the Inspector General, so that one of the things we certainly know in policing is you need to control your internal affairs. You need to deal with the issues of corruption, but here we create something where the Border Patrol has to rely on a separate federal agency 
to do its corruption investigations. That's just one example of the nightmare that was created with Homeland Security. Well-intended ideas, but terribly unintended consequences. Similarly with the Bureau, I think, in the rush to get the Bureau engaged uh, into the issue of uh, terrorism, uh, I think they move too fast. That, uh, and unfortunately, in both the instance of DHS and the Bureau, the way Congress is so totally dysfunctional at this particular point in time, there is no ability to effectively, uh, at this time, change the path, if you will. We're, we're going down a, a road that uh, is going to be extraordinarily bumping my prediction going forward into the future. Uh, and that is uh, the, one of the unfortunate legacies coming out of 9-11 where everything was all about terrorism and we lost uh, focus on the other things that are going on in America at the same time. Well, the, the FBI today is divided about 50-50 national security versus criminal. Um, one of the questions is if you're going to take 50% of your people and put them towards one area um, because that's your top priority and you can't afford to miss there, uh, did the agency need to get bigger? Is the FBI big enough? Um, and that might be a question for a, another panel, but let me get to, to, to Mike Downing and Rick Fuentes. One of the greatest generators of information and intelligence um, is the generic work of police. Car stops, encounters on the street, calls to residences, observations made in, 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 in responding to calls. You have worked, um, particularly Mike, and together with Rick, to figure out a way to lasso this information. Because when you rub it up against other data, you start to find connections. Uh, have you had the right support from the federal government? Um, and how, to the extent that you have or haven't, have you gone forward and pulled this together? How do we harness what cops know? Well, there's, there's certainly great opportunity with over 17,000 police agencies and seven or 800,000 uh, state and local cops throughout the United States, there's a great opportunity that hasn't been adequately tapped yet, I believe. And the SARS was probably the first process to do that. Um, but I think we're still in kind of a centralized intelligence mentality. And when you look at the morphing of the threat, the evolution of the threat, the intelligence signal uh, seems to be getting weaker in terms of the, uh, as Brian would say, the stray dogs, et cetera. Well, let me let me just interrupt you to get yeah. to some mechanics, though. Okay. If there's three guys filming the, the buttresses that hold up a bridge in L.A. Harbor, and then there's three guys who end up filling the buttresses that hold up the base of a bridge in Dallas uh, or Las Vegas or Chicago, and the police find that report and write it up, do those two reports find each other? Probably not likely. It's and probably not likely because they're two separate fusion centers. Unless intelligence products are written, and shared or they're part of a request for information process. But that's where we need to get better. We need to look at this virtual network that we have of 72 fusion centers. They need to market collection plans so it's not so haphazard, so it's very focused on what the threat is. And I represent uh, one of 56 major city chief intelligence commanders. And if you were asked them today, what is your level of understanding of domestic intelligence in the United States on a scale of one to 10, they'd probably say a six because they couldn't say this is the threat domain. This is the adversary, this is his capability, this is his intent. And I think that's where we're headed. So now that you, and you eventually- You said something so else interesting a second ago. You said collection plans. Yes. Do most police departments, even big city police departments, understand intelligence collection plans, collection requirements, and things like the mechanics of that. Well, that's, I think, where the federal government can sponsor us. I, I know it's, uh, it's illegal for the federal government to task state and locals with this, but uh, we have a collection plan. I'm sure New York has a collection plan. Many, they're starting to have collection plans. As major cities, we're starting to say all major cities will have collection plans. But what we're lacking is capability, and, um, and, and because of that, collection is haphazard. So what we're asking for, what we have asked for, is uh, federal sponsorship from DNI, from DHS, to not task us with collecting, but help set some guidelines for intelligence requirements based on the threat. What we see now is, is domestic intelligence impacts foreign intelligence, foreign intelligence impacts domestic intelligence, and state and locals really need some guidance to step up to the plate. They're building their competencies, we have a great infrastructure in place that is perfectly aligned to complement 
the FBI's program, but what we need now is training to, to build that capability. And Rick? Well, I think Mike is absolutely right. Until we include those 17 or 18,000 smaller departments uh, in the country, we're not going to get to the finish line on information sharing. And if you look at most of the plots that have occurred domestically uh, over the last 10 years, a lot of the pre-operational planning and hiding out <clears throat> and dress rehearsals and the buying of products to carry out those attacks occurred uh, in the suburban or rural areas, and then the charisma of the attack occurred uh, in the major cities. I think the major cities, the state police agencies, the federal government have fallen at the line on the information sharing environment, but we're not quite there yet because of that smaller department that's still parked outside. Now, to pull that off, you're going to need a certain healthy amount of federal imperialism here. Uh, and I think that that exists in the 72 fusion centers because, quite frankly, and I think as Mike pointed out, some of these fusion centers are all over the map uh, in terms of their maturity and their baseline technologies. Uh, their privacy policy, so it requires uh, a level, a healthy level of federal environment to get everybody on the same page to establish uniformity. So I think when we do, and, and that's the thing I worry about most now, I worry about not the cities uh, in New Jersey from an information gathering and sharing perspective, I worry about the smaller departments, case in point was the Fort Dick Six, who came from a suburban to rural area in South Jersey who practiced their weapons uh, in Pennsylvania uh, and in south, uh, southwest New Jersey, uh, really out of the sight of everybody but that small uh, department. And until we link them in, we're going to have a problem getting to the finish line with this. So there have been an average since 9-11 of four plots targeting U.S. soil every year, up until 2008. And then something happens. It jumps to eight plots and then 10 plots, and on, in 2011, we're well on track to beat that. Suddenly, it doubled. We've talked about the narrative today. What have you seen in your cities? How has the narrative changed? And why has it suddenly become more appealing to more people um, at this uh, level of growth? I'm going to. I'm going to go to Mike, because without getting into your cases, I know you have a very <laughs> rich environment there in terms of the number of places you are looking where people are actually talking about doing things. Yeah, I mean, we have the second largest American Muslim population in the United States with somewhere between 500 and 600,000 American Muslims, maybe 49 mosques. Um, we deal, and that's a big part of our strategy, uh, actually Chief Bratton was there that uh, design, helped design this, what is to really overlay this community policing enterprise on top of diaspora communities, communities that are pushed and pulled in different direction because of their home countries, because they feel oppressed, discontented, they have grievances, they're in this nonviolent struggle. So we spend a lot of time uh, in mosques, at community events, talking to leaders, talking to grassroots organizations. The whole essence of trying to do that is to help push individuals and groups towards supporting our values and creating a bigger gap between the hardcore radicals and people that are just in a nonviolent struggle. It does two things. It's not an inoculation against extremism. It's more of a prescription to build healthy, strong communities where terrorism can't take root. On the other end of the, on the other side of the equation, it lets us see the hardcore radical groups and individuals so that we can investigate, arrest, and prosecute. John, let, let me see if I make sure I understood <coughs> your question correctly. You were asking, are you referencing that the number of detected plots has been increasing yes. over the last several years? And, and the, the indicator, the implied indicator is that the bad guys have gotten better at marketing because more people who are on U.S. soil um, who may have never actually physically met any al-Qaeda people overseas, uh, whether it's the use of YouTube, the internet, chat rooms, or so on, are willing to go forward and kill their fellow countrymen um, or put their lives on the line to do things in far greater numbers than we've ever seen before. So the concern is when you go from four plots a year in the Fort Dix era where you had Fort Dix, Miami, and you know, it seemed manageable. When you have a pace that's literally 
a plot a month, the odds of being able to get all of them become really challenging and the relevancy of local police um, as collectors, spotters, and initiators of those cases goes up markedly. Are, are we properly prepared? A, a perspective, several of the previous panels talked about the proliferation of the, uh, the homegrown plot, the uh, lone wolf, the stray dog, whatever, because of the uh, inability of Al-Qaeda and similar groups, because of all the pressure on them and losing the training camps, to pull off the major attacks and now actively encourage any type of action to keep a momentum going. So certainly they're more involved in that encouragement than they might have been when they were trying to put together, and you've talked uh, eloquently about this, the different lectures I've heard you give, about Al-Qaeda always wanted to do the multiple event, the big event. So they really weren't focused on encouraging individual actions, they wanted to control it. And now it seems that they don't have that ability to pull off the big one, at least it would have been able to check, but uh, encouraging. So there's more encouragement. But I'm wondering also the idea that uh, are we just getting better at detecting them? <coughs> are they, in fact, have they always been characters out there plotting and intriguing, but never get it to an actionable stage that we missed? But because of their own deficiencies, inefficiencies, they never were able to pull it off and we never became aware of it. Are we that much better now at detecting them in their uh, birthing stages? And if you look at a number of the ones that we have uh, intercepted successfully over the last several years, we're getting at them very early on and then watching as they grow to where it becomes a plot that we have now in fact have the ability to intercept and take to court. So I'm, I'm, I've got two trains of thought there. Certainly there's more activity being encouraged because of Al-Qaeda and other groups' inability to pull off the big one. But I'm wondering also, is it reflective of our increasing capabilities to detect more of them than we had in the past? All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna go out to your questions right after this, but I'd like to follow up with John Timoney. A lot of those plots in this increase model, and you know this, Mike and, and Rick, from looking at it, are building out active shooter situations because it is low tech, low cost, and pretty available statewide or stateside. John Timoney, having worked in the environments of, in particular, Philadelphia and Miami, mm -hmm. how do you view a good size American city's um, posture at responding to the Mumbai model? Multiple attacks, fairly close together in a big city framework. Yeah. Well, to the, to the Mumbai attack itself, I, I was like, I think everybody here, glued to the television that whole weekend, you remember it. And, and the one part that stuck out to me, and I'm not criticizing the bravery of the police officers at the scene, but it, it was clearly, it was mass confusion. Just the information that I was getting on the television, I could tell that one or two people making phone calls could give the appearance of, you know, one, five people called out of shots fired on this floor, that floor, you think there are shots fired on all the floors, and that, that turned out to be not the case. If you're used to that, you, you, you'll, you'll kind of manage the situation. My sense is, and certainly in, in America, post-Columbine, where police departments have developed their SWAT units, active shooter scenarios, uh, I, I think an American policing would be in a better position. To have, I'm not, not perfect, but I think in a better position, uh, both from an armaments perspective, but also from training, dealing with a uh, situation like that on a, on a daily basis, especially in a post columbine uh, world. But the, the one thing that was lacking in India, again, I'm not being critical, it just looked like mass confusion. They were scared, the daylights out. You could see them on television, not quite clear. what. There was no command and control. It didn't look like there was anybody in charge. In American policing, we've got this thing down pretty well. It's not perfect, but pretty good now as far as incident command, in, in who's theory, in charge. But have you gamed it out? Well, we gamed it out with you in Miami. And <laughs> well, I was cheating when I asked. <laughs> no, and, 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 and when you see a situation like that, when you have, when you have a seaport city, uh, I, I, when I first got to Miami, I said, the vulnerabilities here are not by the air, it's by the water. There's so many, it's a huge bay, so many tributaries, islands, there's a million ways. And then you look down from the helicopter, and there's 10,000 white recreational boats. They all look the same thing. They have drugs, guns, Explosives, it's a real difficult situation. And, and I think cities like Miami, the vulnerability isn't from the air or something like that, it's coming in 
through the waterways, something similar to Mumbai. And when you have, when you have hotels along the coastline, you know, in various shapes and forms, it's, it's a real, real difficult task. So looking at Mumbai, how did LA have to re-engineer how they looked at the active shooter situation if it broke out in four places at once um, with the injection of wild cards like exploding taxis and bombs? Yeah, I, I actually took a team of uh, five people to Mumbai to study how a, a city of 18 million people dealt with this. And when we came back, uh, Chief Bratton was the chief at the time, and the training division got involved. We really looked at the problem and were we properly equipped? Did we have the proper firepower? Did we have the proper training? Did we have the right tactics and strategy uh, to encounter something like this, put it down, and bring conditions back to normal as possible? As a result of that, uh, we did several things. We uh, regionally, with our partners, we developed the MACTAC, the Multi Assault Counterterrorism Capabilities Tactic where every police officer was armed with an urban police rifle, uh, put into designated squads, uh, developed tactics on rapid action deployment. So there's a whole mindset shift in dealing with that, uh, believing that, you know, that first 20, 30 minutes was crucial to put that down to uh, keep them away from high rises, hostage taking, all that kind of situation. Um, and we've developed exercises, communication, incident command structures, team leaders, command and control. So it's a whole other level of dealing with something much different than a barricade suspect, much different than a hostage, or even um, you know an assault inside a mall, because you have multiple locations, you have multiple people involved, and so it was a specific. Uh, it was a chapter in a in a book. John, along that line, this is the critical role of. Uh, the FBI, if you will, that LA, New York would have the capacity to send people there to look at it firsthand, but the other 17,000 police agencies aren't going to have that capability. And lessons learned from Mumbai was so critical uh, in terms of changing tactics and strategies that uh, we would employ in the United States. So it really reinforces uh, the benefit of since 9-11 that there is a much closer working relationship between the Bureau and local agencies and that uh, reinforcing in my mind that idea of the duality of the FBI role that uh, going forward. And uh, again, that I think all of us, four of us sitting here certainly, uh, it has never been satisfactorily answered for me uh, why we don't have more of the Fort Hood type incidents, that the attention that's attracted to that type of incident with 300 million guns in this country, it's just amazing to me uh, that we don't have more of those types of incidents. And I've never <coughs> heard any one of the experts, whether the group this morning or others, ever be able to speak to why we don't have more of that uh, in this country. And thank God we don't, because we, I don't think we certainly have the answer to that type of activity. All right, John? John, j j just a postscript on the, on the earlier question regarding the increase uh, in plots. Uh, and my sense is, you know, it's a traditional, whether it's in Israel or here, where you, 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 you isolate somebody, you go in, you have a person work them over, create a suicide bomber or some kind of an attacker. All that's been done on the internet now. Alawi is the, it's a classic example of Fort Hood. He's able, through the internet, to reach mass audiences uh, where he doesn't have to go in and just target uh, a specific person and go through the ritual of, of you know, converting him over to be a bomber, a shooter, what have you. He's a larger audience, and so the, uh, my sense is, is the, it's the internet and, and the television, the, the, the images on television of the wars and what have you, and then the, the ability of the internet, if you will, to, to, as a rallying point. I think if you look at uh, what, what Mike Sheehan framed earlier as, you know, the three plots where you could argue they succeeded and we failed, or as, or as uh, Commissioner Bratton wrote in a Daily News op-ed, um, the reason the plane didn't blow up over Detroit is not because we did everything <laughs> right, it's because they did something wrong. Um, you've got uh, Umar Farouk abdul Matalib on Christmas Day 2008 who breaks the detonator so his bomb doesn't function, but otherwise that would have blown up. Would there be only 3% of Americans who consider terrorism the main problem facing us if a plane had exploded over Detroit with 300 people on board on Christmas Day? Uh, would that percentage have gone up had a truck bomb exploded in Times Square with Faisal Shahzad, Shahzad? And Major Hassan shooting certainly had a dramatic effect. But what ties it together from your point is, 
Major Hassan was talking to Amwar Alaki yep. and looking for inspiration over the internet. Abdul Matalib was recruited by Amwar Alaki and, and inspired person to person, trained and sent on his way. And Faisal Shahzad, who put the truck bomb in Times Square, said, I watched Amwar Alaki's videos on YouTube and nobody else ever broke it down for me the way he did. When I watched his videos, I thought he was talking to me. So it raises uh, the question that tags on your observation about why haven't we had more of these. Has Al-Qaeda figured out in the narrative um, that the messenger is more important than the message? When you have someone with charisma like that who's reaching people. Speaking of reaching people, <laughs> um, let's go for uh, questions. I'm going to go dead center right there. And a mic is coming your way, and just if you could give your name as you go. Stanley Goldstein. Uh, in police work, profiling, however you term it, has been a big weapon for 2,000 years. How much of an impediment is local governments and civil liberty unions uh, in hindering police in the local and national level? Who wants to tackle that? Don't jump up all at once. I, I'll, I'll take a whack at it. It's, listen, there, there's always going to be tension between uh, the police establishment and the civil rights community. There always is, and, and that's, a, that's, that, that, that's just a fact. There, it's, it's depending on what city uh, you're in, uh, you know, I think people will be willing to tolerate uh, the police more. I don't think anybody could have articulated uh, what the mission of the NYPD is today, better than Ray Kelly did this morning. You know, he's the guy that's got the obligation to protect these citizens. And he's not, he's not uh, violating civil rights uh, willy-nilly. He, he has a system set up that, and I know him, uh, that he's not going to do this with the idea of, uh, I don't care how I get to the end, um, uh, by hook or by crook, that, that's not his style. By the same token, he shouldn't uh, be constrained, if you will, by such artificial things that come out of the 60s, like the Hanshu, the Hanshu uh, decision. I sat on, on the Hanshu Commission when Bill Bratton uh, was the police commissioner. And, and people would argue, the Hanshu said, the police department can do these investigations, but first you must come before the Hanshu Commission with, with a case, and then we'll say yay and nay going forward. Well, if you understand cops and how it goes, if you throw obstacles in front of them, they're just going to back off. It's going to diminish their enthusiasm, their initiative. And so while I, I'm, I'm also, uh, I also understand cops, and so you can't give them free reign. So there has to be a, a balance, and I think Ray Kelly in the city has achieved that balance, not violating uh, civil rights, but being very aggressive. And by the way, I said to a few people uh, this morning, that sounds like his an apology tour, if you will. <laughs> uh, that he, he articulated what his responsibilities are, and he's not backing down. And at the same token, he's not violating people's rights. Okay. Um, to the man in the pink tie. Now, I, I gotta, I gotta say, I mean, the bar has been set very high this morning because you <laughs> actually, you have socks that match your tie and handkerchief. Can you say that? <laughs> not really. No. All right. Well, now you know where you, the next level. Something to shoot for. A uh, simple <laughs> question for the panel, because a number of you mentioned the challenge of the FBI handling both law enforcement and national security. Does anybody think that the U.S. needs an MI5? I think you have written on that extensively. Let me, <laughs> the issue so, that John, so John, John talked about, and he's certainly intimate with it because he was in the Bureau for a number of years, that the idea that with only 11, well, I think they've gone up to 13,000 agents. So instead of approximately 10,000 agents focusing on local crime, they're now down around 5,000. What suffers in that equation? We certainly benefit by all the extra attention to terrorism, but in the recent uh, financial issues the country found itself in, with all of the potential opportunities to go after criminal activity and the collapse of the housing market and all of those areas, the Bureau didn't have resources to investigate that, and I would argue the financial loss from that activity and the impact <clears throat> in the United States and some of the criminal elements of that is more significant than the events of 9-11 other than the serious loss of life, the 3,000 lives that were lost. But when you look at 100 million Americans whose lives are impacted by potential criminal activity in the housing market and the loan market, 
and the Bureau doesn't have the resources, and it's the only federal agency that is basically empowered to investigate something like that, that's what we're losing. Same for cybercrime, identity theft, that where local agencies are never going to have the capacity to investigate that type of crime. It has to be done at the national level. But by having the resources of the agency that's responsible for that, we all end up suffering. So are you arguing that the Bureau needs to Bureau be needs made... Bureau needs many more people. So it needs to be made bigger, but the, the, the point at the end of the question was, um, and Mike Sheehan sat up here today and said, you know, we don't do it as well as the Brits. Um, is there a place for the MI5 model in America, a non-police domestic intelligence agency? No. I, I, I don't believe so. I believe that... Is that, that was? Whole, okay. Whole, what we talked about this morning up here, the premise of the sharing of information between the local and the feds is better now than it's ever been. And the idea is we're losing some of that benefit because the feds, half of their resources are no longer focused on local crime. Similarly, if you break off from the Bureau and set up a separate agency to do terrorism, and then the other one is only focused on crime, you're effectively repeating the mistake of the CIA and FBI division that was mandated by Congress back in the 70s and 80s where they couldn't talk to each other. So I don't think by creating a separate agency to investigate terrorism, a separate agency to investigate crime, would solve anything. If anything, my, 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 my thinking is you enlarge it to handle the crime issue as well as the uh, terrorism issue. All right, we're going to go out again. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to you in a second, but I'm going to go back right there and um, just identify yourself with the question. Uh, Neil Sullivan, uh, after 9-11, there was a lot of talk about the battle of ideas. I remember Karen Hughes was put up in the White House as fighting that battle. I don't hear anything about it anymore. Uh, is there a battle of ideas domestically? Apparently the threat is greater here uh, on those internet sites or in, in the certain communities. Is, are we fighting that front? Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go to um, Mike Downing or Rick Fuentes. Um, in the battle of ideas um, in policing, where has, where has that developed in terms of the function of policing allowing itself to have the community involvement with people to check the counter narrative. Yeah, I mean we dealt with that a lot in our five years of outreach with the Muslim communities. We've talked about the development of a counter narrative and we kind of settled on uh, it's really more effective to shoot holes in the narrative that exists. Um, it's interesting, the, the talk that we're having now with our communities is especially after the pastor from Florida came up and threatened to burn the Quran, which caused all kinds of stir you know, in our community, is look, the, the police are here to protect the values of the Constitution. We protect the sacred text of the Quran, we protect the sacred text of the Torah, we protect the sacred text of the Bible, and we need you to protect the sacred text of our country, which is the United States Constitution and the principles that exist in that. And so we've asked these groups to put in their mission statements to talk to their congregation about how important that is. And, and then the other groups that denounce that. You could tell who is not supportive very, very easily and very quickly. And so that's the narrative we're dealing with now in, in our outreach is how important it is for these communities. Uh, in fact, we've even asked the 18 member Fig Council of North America to, uh, as a Sharia principle, to acknowledge that the United States Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And I think that's where we're headed with our narrative. Okay, right there. Um, I, I could probably do it at the mic. Oh. Um, the theme you started, John, Lydia Stiano, you started, John, by discussing and questioning sustainability. And it's one of the issues that I've heard at every single panel, and nobody has really taken it on. One of the things I think we always forget about because we are always talking amongst ourselves so much, uh, both as practitioners and academics, is that there are 335 million people we have to re-engage. We heard a lot about narrative, all different kinds of narrative. We have failed dramatically to maintain a narrative with the American public 
which who are going to be the people who are going to say, yes, we're not just three or five percent anymore. We have to invest these dollars because we are being publicly educated. There are a couple of points I just want to put out, and I always do this. Okay. The, 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 really, the statement is, the idea is to conceive of and start dis creating discussions with your public, um, with the public, the American public. And there are a myriad of ways to do that. It's being done at Northcom, and I just implore that you kind of take a look at what Northcom, Arcom are doing in the J7, and it is making a difference. All right. Um Anybody want to uh, sum up because to stay on track because we're right to the minute here. Um, we have 20. We have the luxury of 20 seconds. Uh, <laughs> would, who would like to who would like to close? Give it to you, Joe. Um, all right. <laughs> to close, then. Um, <laughs> I, I I think I think you framed the closing perfectly, and I, and I compliment you and your team on the work you do with police departments and and with the state university center and so on because it. It keeps them focused. They say nothing succeeds like success. And when you look at the discussion thread today about 10 years after 9-11 with threats of a storm of airplanes and things that would make us forget all about 9-11 and the streets would run red with blood, the idea that we've gotten by with a nearly 100% record, certainly 100% if you talk about an attack on the level of 9-11, um, we have succeeded as a team. Special forces, the intelligence community, the law enforcement community linked together. That's the good news. The flip side is, and, and the fact that we're having these conferences 10 years later is a sign of continued focus, is success in another way has been our worst enemy. Um, they were about to cut staff at the National Counterterrorism Center until the Christmas Day plot showed them that they were drowning in information. So rather than cutting 65 analysts, they added 100. The point is, sometimes the only way for a country to sustain this level of focus over this, this amount of time is for something bad to happen to, to remind people of the possibility. The near misses may not be dramatic enough. And while we've stayed focused for 10 years, when you look out at a problem that, as you have often said, is not going away this year or next year, um, what will our ability to be to continue succeeding but also to sustain and fund this level of effort. And I think that will be how we close today with an open question that may set the table for the afternoon. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking to the Manhattan Institute.